So, uh, my name is uh, Damascene Joachim Pillai, as you can see, it's a very long name, probably the longest in this whole room. Uh, but they call me DJ, and uh, I am uh, from Verizon. And uh, for those of you who don't know who Verizon is, uh, we are a small telco out of the United States. Uh, and uh, we run a, a wireless network, uh, and also a wireline network. Uh, even though we are divesting from the wireline networks from quite a bit, and we are shrinking to the northeast side of the country, but uh, we have a significant uh, presence in the wireless network. Um, I'm actually uh, part of an organization in uh, Verizon called Products, and we concentrate on uh, developing applications uh, that ride on top of the network. Uh, we don't uh, necessarily always get ourselves involved in the day-to-day -day operations of the network, but we actually have uh, significant applications that ride on top of the network that we actually host. And uh, this is where we encountered uh, data centers of large scale and the issues with uh, running a data center of large scale. Um, there are a lot of companies that have done this many times before, like Google and Facebook and Amazon and Microsoft, they have perfected the art of uh, running data centers at scale. Uh, Verizon, we have mostly been involved on the network side, but we are slowly moving into large-scale data center. It's primarily not for public consumption, even though the information that we store and we manage is actually public information, but it's primarily for private use. So it is not, uh, we don't sell uh, virtual spaces for others to come and occupy, we actually provide it as part of our service offering. So that's in a nutshell where um, we come from, and that's where we encounter networking and networking-related issues. Um, I am responsible for the networking and the security of the data centers, and that's where my uh, responsibility lies, and that's where I encounter a lot of challenges. And uh, when I look at Linux networking, uh, which I have been looking at it for the last, I don't know, about <laughs> since 1999, I think uh, the first um, Linux machine that I ran was, uh, I don't know, for, for people that, are, that have used it for a long time, there used to be a, uh, a distribution that started with Y. I don't know how to pronounce the name, eGradcell was the name of the distribution. I started running it way back, and um, you have to actually pass command line um, arguments to bootstrap your SCSI card, otherwise your, uh, your, uh, your spinning media won't even be recognized if you don't have proper SCSI hard drives in those days, if I remember correctly. So I've been dabbling in Linux for a long time, so for me it was a natural extension, but as things have moved from those days to today, I see the, especially with, with respect to networking, uh, the number of applications that the Linux networking stack has to support is all the way from handsets, like Android handsets, to data center switches and large-scale routers. And so the, the, the application is, is quite a significant uh, variety. And uh, if I look at uh, how it should work, is uh, what is required on the host is quite significantly different than what is required on the middle box. The scale is different, uh, what needs to scale is different, uh, because for an endpoint it's a much simpler issue for a, uh, for a middle box, it's a different issue. So how do you uh, bring all this together and then keep the user interface as common and as usable as possible is the biggest challenge that I face, and I think a lot of people that actually use it in this space will face the same issue. And um, this is when um, I know Jamal for a long time, and uh, we were talking about this for a little while, and then finally uh, he said, why don't we have a network-specific uh, uh, discussion group where we can actually share this information and people can come and present and you can 
uh, go back and forth with ideas and then we can actually come to a, a decision and move forward and that actually brought us to NetDev 0.1 and that was last year in, um, in, uh, in Ottawa and uh, we were one of the first uh, sponsors of that uh, conference as well. And that's because I think uh, the conversation that happens in this room and the speed with which uh, things get adopted and worked through is quite impressive, to be honest with you, because if I remember correctly, it was not a year ago that we were talking about switch dev. And all of a sudden, there's a, a virtual switch in place and uh, I heard a lot of conversation about the challenges of integrating a switch dev into a real switch, which is quite an astounding um, a short period of time within which a lot of things have happened. And uh, I like the speed with which things happen in a forum like this, where a lot of people are not necessarily, uh, I should be careful in what I say, uh, not necessarily marketing people that sell me stuff, but actually engineers who are actually sitting there and writing code, who understand what the issues are with a specific approach versus some other approach. Um, and so this is why I, I would really love to take this opportunity to do, highlight a couple of things that I am seeing as um, things that are thrust in front of us that make us uh, having to take, take back and take stock of what we have and what we need to have. So one of the things that, um, that I looked at over the NetDev 1.1, the last line at the highlighted banner that you can see is, um, is the statement that I actually strongly believe in. A lot of people come and tell me, oh, we run Linux. And uh, they run Linux fine, but it's mostly to provide a CLI interface. And the CLI then has custom uh, libraries that then invoke custom code. And everybody is going to give me a different CLI and a different custom code. And now I have uh, uh, 20 different variations of CLI and 20 different patch streams that I have to maintain. And it becomes a nightmare for us from a network operations perspective. Some of the others, they have actually um, uh, created their own versions of Linux and they are actually m managing it themselves. We are in neither boat. We, we need uh, vendors to supply us equipment, but we also need to make sure that we don't have too many variabilities in what we get uh, delivered. This is why I believe that um, uh, I would like to use the Linux, especially the Linux networking stack, as much as possible for whatever we need to do, and then only go outside of it for additional uh, operations. So for instance, uh, we run uh, a, a large-scale application uh, using mostly containers. And uh, it's, it went live in, in November, December timeframe. It's slowly ramping up, and as it goes on, uh, what I'm seeing is that we need more and more taxing is going to happen on the networking layer because uh, containers are going to come and go and networks have to be plumbed and unplumbed and policies have to be maintained. And uh, so when, when we go into that kind of stuff, the, the offload discussion that we had for the last few days in hardware offload becomes very important for us to get the scale. Uh, you doing everything in the CPU is not necessarily the best option. If I can have hardware acceleration, then it'll be the best thing uh, that I will actually be able to use. And um, the other thing that I wanted to also point out was we, a lot of times we look at uh, user space implementations of stuff, um, especially with respect to networking. Uh, for us, user space networking stack is very good and it av avoids a lot of overhead in, in some ways because every time there's a kernel to use a copy, there's going to be uh, locks taken and contact switching and all of that, the, that great stuff that goes along with it. But it also adds a lot of um, uh, complexity to the code as well as it slows down significantly the performance of CPUs. And that's what has been uh, shown to us in many ways 
that every time you cross over the user to network, user to kernel, it's going to cause us a lot of grief. So if I have a very large scaled application and that is crossing the user kernel boundary, it's going to cost a lot. So how do we minimize it uh, is what my other big challenge is. And we have been trying to look at it um, uh, to make sure that we keep as much stuff in the kernel as possible or kernel and below as possible and just only come up to the user space for breathing, let's say. Because if I have a transit network traffic, I don't have to go all the way to the user space to come back down all the time. But that in itself provides a lot of challenges because the APIs will have to be looked at and how it works has to be looked at. A lot of people have a very well defined southbound interface in the socket API. So in the networking space especially, if I have to use sockets to read and write stuff to take advantage of the um, excellent TCP stack that exists in the Linux kernel today, there is a certain amount of tax I have to pay for it. How do I minimize that and how do I make sure that I can take full advantage of the CPUs is, uh, is what one of our biggest challenges today. And um, going forward, that's what I would like to um, see uh, working for us. And uh, at this point, I would like to take a minute to thank um, Jamal, uh, Pablo, uh, Dave, wherever he is, uh, for letting me speak here. And uh, I am open for questions if you guys have any questions. OK, so DJ, you're wearing a switch tab t-shirt. What, what are you implying here? Oh, <laughs> as I said before, uh, the speed with which switch dev came together, and we have always been on the, on, the, on the view that a switch is nothing but a, a high port density NIC, is how we looked at it. And see the, the, the Linux kernel team, uh, Linux network uh, team come together and create that view in such a short period of time goes to the flexibility of the actual implementation of the networking stack in the kernel. And also the motivation of all the offloads that we keep talking about that actually made it possible to make that happen in such a short period of time. And that <clears throat> impressed me, actually. So something, some big SDK vendor versus a switch dev vendor. If you had a Boolean logic, which one is true there? My preference is, as I said, I don't want to boot Linux to use some CLI. As soon as I have um, uh, uh, some other implementation, I have to know the CLI. I have to learn the CLI. And if I have a variation in the CLI, then I have to learn a new set of CLI. It becomes a nightmare for you to manage it, or I have to standardize it, or I have to write a layer on top of it to abstract the CLIs, all of which we have in our network today, by the way. And I'm trying to move away from it, because from our perspective, Linux has a, a very well understood, a scriptable environment, which I can use as a northbound interface to operate on. Why would I need more stuff, is my question. Hi. Hi. Um, so this is uh, it's very interesting. I'm wondering, though, at a high level, can you describe kind of the scale of the problem? And what I'm thinking is the larger the scale, the more difficult it may be to apply some of these newer technologies. At least that's my experience. Yes, the scale is uh, fairly large right now. Uh, so we have uh, two distinct applications. And one application is actually sitting in the, in the wireless network that we run. And I would like to bring this setup into that space as well at some point uh, in the near future, probably in the next year or so. <laughs> but the, other, the data center side is actually we are building it as we speak right now. And that's. Uh, about four data centers right now. 
Is that the kind of scale that you're so, looking for? So four data centers, so that, that's actually pretty, pretty impressive. In terms of the applications, are you able to characterize, like, this is our normal application, um, like resource utilization and things like that, or are you finding that it's all over the board such that even if you optimize for one application, maybe another application doesn't benefit? Uh, yeah, so, so the, in our case, uh, most of the applications fit into a certain model, except for certain applications are more um, outbound oriented, and some applications are inbound oriented. So uh, let me give you an example. So we have an application called VC Cloud. So you have all your phones have pictures and contacts. We back it up automatically for you. And that application is mostly inbound. And then you also know that we uh, have Go90, which is actually a video playback uh, service that we provide. That's mostly outbound traffic that we have. So those are the kind of two different uh, spectrums of applications that I can actually talk about that we currently have that will most likely come into this data center that's going to be running out of the data center. OK, so <clears throat> one last question related to that. So in terms of your development strategy, are you finding that it's mostly trying to tune systems, do experimentation? Are, are you able to actually do like kernel development for things that you absolutely need? And then in terms of like, like vendors and the new technology, how easy do you find it to kind of integrate? OK, so vendors of new technology is um, most of the time, what we see is uh, a lot of vendors have a lot of new technology in the roadmap, and we never see them come to fruition. They actually disappear. And other vendors have existing ones. They painted green one day, blue another day, red another day, and they just bring it to me and sell it to me. Um, as far as kernel development is concerned, we actually rely mostly on people like Jamal and others to actually uh, help us with some of those things, if, if, if it is agreeable with the kernel development team. We don't get everything we want, but some of the things that we want, we may get it done. Because some of the, the, the requirements are also very, um, uh, very specific to us, and we are aware of that. And when there are requirements that are specific to us, we don't always push it to the kernel. We'll try to solve it another way either a box in the front or a box in the back or something else. We'll do something else to solve our problems that way instead of pushing everything into kernel because if I have to push everything into kernel, I have to be in the bleeding edge of the kernel. And I haven't seen anything that's at the bleeding edge of the kernel that actually can provide me with the user space applications that I need. Well, I mean, I mean clearly that's true, but one thing that's really nice about Linux and using an open source operating system for a scenario like this is, so it's not so easy just to come and say, here's a whole bunch of requirements for us, please implement them. Uh, that's kind of not the way it works. The way it works is more like, um, like it's up to you to kind of, if, if you contribute something, and then build on that. So what I, what I see a lot of is we, we start with very small things like some of the, the packet steering and things like that. And over the years, this mushrooms. And <clears throat> some of this stuff fits very well into the data center model. Some of it doesn't. Some of it's more you know, for completely different use cases. But the net effect is, in some sense, if, if we are somehow getting the requirements in, and I think you being here is a great, a great thing to do, getting the requirements back to the actual developers development community, then that gives us the opportunity to actually build solutions that fit into this model. And that's why I asked, like, how easy it is, is it to update hardware across your data center? That's oh, a really hard problem for anyone. So we're talking years before we get, like, switched up and things like that into production. So we need to be aware of that, but also gives us the opportunity, if we can do stuff in software in the short term, that solves some of these problems. So it's kind of like we want to approach this from all angles, but again, we need the you know, the, the resource requirements. And we definitely know that wireless and data center and end users have very, very different requirements. Trying to satisfy those in one OS is always a challenge. That, that's the biggest challenge that I have, right? Uh, when I have so much of variation in my application space, getting one, one solution to solve it is very different. But 
in our current data center, we are trying to build it in such a way that we can actually flip out any, uh, any part of the uh, hardware anytime we want just to try out a new one because we are trying to build a scale out model and then we are not trying to make sure, we are trying to make it, make it modular enough that if I change something, it doesn't always uh, make everything else not usable. So that's what we are trying yeah, to do. Yeah, sure. Spend. I mean, you, you have to protect your investment. Right. I mean, there are certain okay. things that we have to protect. Others, I am willing to change it. Uh, right now, we are thinking about how do I wire up top of rack switches to end of row. <laughs> you know, it's, it's as simple as that one itself is, a, is not a, such a simple thing. If you actually look at the bundle of wires that have to carry over yeah. uh, from one place to another when you have so many racks in, in, in one location. So we are actually looking at how do we uh, optimize those paths and make sure that the, um, the switches that we have can be modified fairly simply. Uh, we are also selecting technologies today that will allow me to change out from a software model to a hardware model fairly easily. That's the other thing I'm very cognizant about. Uh, if, if there is a software model that will lend itself to be accelerated by hardware, that is the model that I will go forward with. And that's why Switch Dev was very attractive to me because it actually allowed me to take what runs on a software can be accelerated using a hardware in, in tomorrow's day. That's what. Have you had success with that so far? Uh, in some mechanisms, I, I, we have. Huh. Uh, for instance, the IPsec that we were talking about earlier, we have had some success in accelerating that in hardware. Um, because bulk encrypt, bulk decrypt can be done in many different hardware, not necessarily on NICs, but other hardware. But other than that, we haven't done too much of that yet. I'm still waiting for the first version of workable hardware <laughs> that I can actually use, which they want. Uh, DJ, your last point oh. about uh, the propagating custom CLIs. Is this more of a statement about you want one CLI or you don't even want any CLI, you want to do things programmatically? I want to do things programmatically. I don't want CLI. CLIs tend to cause grief. It will always have bifurcation at some point because everybody wants... Gone are the days when people wanted to make a differentiation in, in hardware. A lot of times nowadays the differentiation and the stickiness comes from the CLI more than anything else. And I'm trying to get rid of that so that it's actually in the implementation that you make the differentiation, not on the user interface. So, so if you, <clears throat> you want to have a programmatic interface to things, do you have any flavor of uh, theology that you want to apply to that? Um, I, I'm, sort of from like the Ansible, REST, Yang, the, all that sort of possible so, universe, or do you not care? My personal preference is RESTful most of the time, and because that's easy to understand and easy to manage, easy to upgrade. Uh, Yang requires a significant amount of upfront lift before you can do anything. Uh, so from that perspective, uh, I have seen um, somebody try to define Yang for a router, and it took them about two years because a lot of people had to come together, and I don't know whether it eventually worked out or not. Uh, when I was part of IETF, that's what I saw. And uh, so it's people uh, sometimes say a lot of things that can be done, doesn't mean that it will be done. And uh, there is a lot of gap between reality and that. So programmatically, I would prefer a simple JSON format that actually I can do RESTful APIs too. That's the best way I, I look at it. If there are no other questions, thank you for being here.